Super Bowl 53 rematch set to take place here tonight on Thursday Night Football between the Los Angeles Rams and the New England Patriots. Could this be the beginning of a new era in Philadelphia? Jalen Hurts has been named the starting quarterback of the Philadelphia Eagles over Carson Wentz. What does that mean for the Eagles going into the postseason, hopefully having a chance at winning the NFC East? Their division rivals, the New York Giants, have surprised many of us with their four-game win streak. Are they the favorites to win that division, the NFC East? It's a topic of discussion because another division rival, the Washington football team, upset the Pittsburgh Steelers, handing the Steelers their first loss of the season. Who haven't looked great the last couple of weeks? Are the Pittsburgh Steelers on a decline going into the NFL postseason? Week 14 news and notes in the NFL to catch up with you guys. That and much more on a brand new episode of Time to Football on this Thursday night pregame show. Glad you guys are joining us. I am your wonderful host of the show, Hassan Khan. A lot of topics to talk about, mainly about the NFC East. We're going to dive into that much later on. What a week of action it was into the, uh, in, in, in week 13. A lot of you guys that play fantasy football, congratulations on making your fantasy football playoffs. I know that was a, uh, a difficult time for many of us to have suffered through injuries, to have suffered through COVID, uh, causing a lot of bye weeks to be switched around, a lot of players being inactive. Uh, for instance, Mark Andrews, James Conner recently. And a lot of people miss some time and some action because of that. But if you guys stuck through it, gutted through it, and have that Cinderella story where you started 0-3, lost Saquon Barkley, and then you eventually made the NFL playoffs like one YouTube commenter commented this past week, congratulations to you guys. And let's go ahead and just gut it out for the next couple weeks and win you that fantasy football championship. You can have that chance to win that championship if you get second opinions from people. If you are in the chat right now previewing or premiering this video as we premiere it live on YouTube, how you guys doing? I'm joining you guys in the chat right now. I'm going to uh, comment something ridiculous right now. I, I don't know what I'm going to comment, but it changes every week, or maybe it just stays the same. I've been commenting uh, one word every single week. I'm just going to go ahead and comment that right now. But... If you have any sort of questions, I'm joining you guys throughout the duration of the show. Ask your fantasy football questions. We all need second opinions. We all need second opinions. This is the time that it matters the most. And let's go ahead and win you that fantasy football title. Uh, if you guys are listening to us on the audio experience, thank you for joining us uh, on iTunes. Listen to us on your way to work, whether it be at the gym, working out as well. You make sure that you go over to YouTube, youtube.com slash time to football. Subscribe to us on there. We'll come out with much more content throughout the week on our YouTube channel. We're going to get to the topics for today's show, but first, we, you, you know what we have to do every single week. We have to give the most prestigious award on this show, and that is the Hungriest Player of the Week. Time to football's Hungriest Player of the Week, the one that wanted it the most. The Checkdown, the NFL's Instagram account, stole this award from me. They created this in 2019. I created it in 2013. Congratulations. You have a big following NFL. You can get sponsors. You have a lot of money. Snickers sponsors you. And you chose Darren Waller to be your hungriest player of the week this week. Well, because you stole an award from me, I'm going to go ahead and steal your choice of hungriest player of the week and say that Darren Waller is this week's hungriest player of the week for us, for Time to Football. Waller the Baller. There can't be a much more fitting name than Waller the Baller. 13 receptions, 200 yards total, and two receiving touchdowns in that amazing victory against the New York Jets. I actually had the Jets pulling off the upset against the Raiders, and I thought they were going to pick up their first victory this past week. But instead, Darren Waller had other hopes. Derek Carr, Henry Ruggs had other hopes as well. Greg Williams had other intentions as well. He didn't want to win that game. And the Raiders put off that amazing comeback victory, and it was all because of Darren Waller. I, you could say it's Henry Ruggs, and Derek Carr was uh, you know, passing those dimes to Darren Waller as well, which credit to those guys as well for helping them pick up that victory. But Darren Waller, if, they weren't, if it weren't for those 200 yards, those two touchdowns, they wouldn't be in that position to pick up that victory. So Darren Waller, congratulations. You have an amazing comeback story into the NFL once you got uh, signed with the Baltimore Ravens and went through some uh, you know, personal issues and then you came back with the Raiders and you have been solid the last couple of years for the Raiders and you are deserving this week, week 14 or week 13, uh, the Hungriest Player of the Week Award. Congratulations. 
Darren Waller. Were the Jets trying to lose that game? I, I, I'm generally curious. I really don't know. I mean, congratulations, Greg Williams, because you uh, you have an early vacation, as like as Pat McAfee said on his show, you have a an early vacation because you're going to get fired anyways. But that leads into week 14 news and notes for the league. And we're going to start off with the New York Jets. Greg Williams, let's talk a little bit more about that. Maybe you wanted to tank, even though it doesn't really matter because you knew that you are going to get fired. Why do you care about the New York Jets and their lack of success in getting Trevor Lawrence? So I, I don't know. I just Who runs cover zero in that in that situation when you're down and or when you're up and there are 13 seconds left and you just have to play that typical Dan Quinn prevent defense? Come on. Come on. This is coming from a Falcons fan. Prevent defense sucks. And that's why we gave up Dan Quinn and got rid of him because he just gave up so many leads from playing prevent defense. But if that, that's the one situation where you have to play prevent defense. Anyways, Greg Williams, fired. Moving on. A topic that we want to talk about on the show, we're going to get more into later on in the, in the show, but just a little tidbit and a little nugget that we want, to, we want to share with you guys, if you guys haven't heard, if you've been living underneath the rock, is that Jalen Hurts has been named the starting quarterback over Carson Wentz for the Philadelphia Eagles. We're going to get into much more details, more in depth later on in the show. Christian McCaffrey now has a quad injury. First, it was a high ankle sprain. Then it was an AC joint injury in his shoulder. And now it's a quad injury that he suffered while working out on his own, being removed on the sideline or having time to himself while working out because being sidelined from that AC joint injury, he now has a quad injury and his status is in doubt this week in week 14 against the Denver Broncos. So uh, Mike Davis, Curtis Samuel, actually Curtis Samuel might be missing this week as well. So a lot of uh, running back, uh, you know, issues there for Carolina and, Christian McCaffrey, they might elect him just to sit him out for the rest of the 2021 or 2020 season, just going to 2021, because you're four and eight. You have really nothing much to play for. The Saints have the lock on the NFC South. You, it's it's going to take a lot for you guys to make the NFL playoffs. So they may elect to just sit out Christian McCaffrey for the remainder of the season. James Conner and Mark Andrews, two recent big names that have been on the COVID-19 list, have now been activated, and they are eligible to play this week. Conner against the Buffalo Bills. And then Mark Andrews against the Cleveland Browns on Monday Night Football. Joe Judge, the New York Giants head coach, is optimistic that Daniel Jones can play this week. Which is surprising because hamstring injuries, for a lot of people, it takes three, four, five weeks to recover. But Joe Joe Judge says that he is optimistic Daniel Jones won't miss any more time. There is a high possibility that he could play against the Arizona Cardinals. And more than likely, it'll come down to a game-time decision, so... Just be sure to monitor that. Drew Brees is eligible to come off IR officially this week at any time. But he may not play until next week against the Kansas City Chiefs. This week, they have the opportunity to clinch the NFC South. They've already clinched a playoff berth. But they might just elect to sit him. And they may need him for that big game against the Kansas City Chiefs. That's going to be a big game if Drew Brees were to come back. Must watch football. But that is your Week 14 News and Notes around the NFL. Some topics we want to talk about. Starting off with Jalen Hurts, the rookie quarterback out of Oklahoma, previously Alabama, will now be starting for the Philadelphia Eagles for the foreseeable future, possibly? We don't know yet. At least for this week against the New Orleans Saints, who more than likely will be without Drew Brees, like we mentioned. But Jalen Hurts will be facing what is a top 10 defense in the Saints this week. Is this a good move or a bad move by the Philadelphia Eagles? He went 5 for 12, 198 yards, one touchdown, and one interception versus the Green Bay Packers after Doug Peterson elected to bench Carson Wentz with the lack of success that he's been having, not just for that game, but for the whole 2020 season. Hertz is now the starting quarterback for the time being. When asking Doug Peterson his thoughts on Jalen Hurts starting for the remainder of the season over Carson Wentz, this is what Doug Peterson had to say. I don't have a crystal ball. I can't predict the future, right? I mean, come on. That's all I can focus is today and getting our team prepared today and getting our guys ready for Sunday. So he is not committed to Jalen Hurts moving forward past this Sunday. 
I want to hear from you guys. Do you guys believe that this is a right move by Doug Peterson, by the Philadelphia Eagles, to finally give Jalen Hurts an opportunity to be a starting quarterback this uh, late in the season? Actually, as a matter of fact, this late in the season, week 14, is the latest that any Philadelphia Eagles rookie quarterback has started in their franchise history, at least uh, from 1950 on, because that's when they started keeping track of that stat. This is a good trial run. This is a good trial run to see what you got with Jalen Hurts. And I know a lot of people, when Jalen Hurts was drafted, were thinking, okay, he's going to go ahead and dethrone Carson Wentz for the starting job. But then there were many other people that said, no, 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 no. Carson Wentz is still good. We still believe that he can play at that MVP level that he once was at. He just needs the right weapons. He needs a lot of these players to get back from these injuries. And a lot of that is true. It really is. And a lot of that did affect his performance this year but at this point week 14 it is time to move on it really is I made a video earlier this season uh, that was talking about how Carson Wentz first off I I, I was a flip-flopper I said that Carson Wentz a lot of people are downgrading him a lot of people are down talking to him he just needs the right pieces around him and then he can be that good productive quarterback and maybe that's still true but then later on I came out with a video after that Sunday night game talking about him playing the the Dallas Cowboys, he just made these throws that just did not look great. It looked like he was doing way too much to make up for a team that doesn't have much. Just interception after fumble, after uh, not throwing the ball away and just costing his team eight yards from a sack and it's just causing them to, to turn it over or punt it and a loss of possession, whatever it may be. Carson Wentz was just slowly just adding on to the decline of the Philadelphia Eagles. And I really hate to say that. I really do. Because I'm a Carson Wentz fan. And I don't know what his future is going to look like. I don't know if he's going to get traded. Now, a lot of people are talking about the Indianapolis Colts. Because of his connections with Frank Reich. Because he loves hunting. So Indianapolis, Indiana. You know, that's it's around that area. But I don't know what the future is going to hold for Carson Wentz. I don't know if he's going to succeed uh, with any other team. But at least this year in 2020. From just what I see. It was time to move on. It is. It's it's time to see what you have in that rookie quarterback. A lot of people wanted this Wentz and Jalen Hurts combination to be like uh, Drew Brees and Taysom Hill. How do you believe that Jalen Hurts is going to do for the remainder of the season? Because if we want to talk about the schedule and their, their chances of making uh, the postseason, because they're still in the running to win the NFC East, believe it or not, at 3-8-1 being the record. The remaining schedule, New Orleans this week, they face Arizona, then they face Dallas, and then face the New York Giants. Out of those games, is it a possibility that they could win maybe two, three? Yeah, I mean, you could beat Washington. You could beat Dallas. And if you pull off an upset against maybe Arizona, who hasn't been looking that great with a Kyler Murray shoulder or Kyler Murray shoulder injury that he's been suffering, has been leading to the decline recently for the Cardinals, maybe. But it's not probable. So at this point, you're more than likely out. And I kind of see the thinking behind uh, Jalen Hurts starting. Like, hey, we do have a chance of making the postseason. But what we need is more so a spark, number one, if we want to have a chance to make it. And number two, like I said, trial run. Just see what you have so you can make a decision on Carson Wentz and the $25 million guaranteed that he's going to be making in 2021. Leave your comments down below. I want to hear your thoughts. Jalen Hurts, is that the right move or not? We're going to take a quick break before we move on to more NFC East teams, talking about the Giants, Washington, the Dallas Cowboys, and that whole division. First, we want to talk about Manscaped. Ladies and gentlemen, Manscaped has been nothing but great and loving to me. They've They've actually given me a couple of their products, which I'm going to show you guys. Let's talk about a few products that are prime stocking stuffers this season. Some of those include the Crop Preserver. Let me just go ahead and pull that out. The Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. The name speaks for itself. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, there are those times you haven't had the opportunity to shower. You haven't had the opportunity to to, to just really take care of yourself. This will come in handy. And I tell you that for, for any guy that has been in that situation with disgusting, not-so-pleasant 
Family Jewels, which all, we, we've all been in that situation. This is a good stocking stuffer for that man in your life. The ball deodorant. Go ahead and get that. The Crop Reviver, the ball toner, a spray-on toner that will give your balls a little slice of heaven with their aloe vera and hazel extracts. Crop Cleanser, body wash, a full body wash that, can, that you can also use on your hair. Because, guys, listen, we love that 3-in-1, 4-in-1, 5-in-1. Why not 6-in-1? Let's just go ahead and throw in toothpaste in that 6-in-1 as well. We like to be simple creatures, and this crop mop that you can, or this crop cleanser that you can use as body wash and as shampoo, beautiful. The Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer, which provides propriety skin-safe technology to get rid of those nasty nose hairs. This is what Manscaped hooked me up with, the Weed Whacker it's amazing. I tried it the other day. My wife loves it. My wife actually loves all these Manscaped products that Manscaped has hooked me up with. Let's not forget about the best trimmer for your butt, balls, and body. The Lawn Mower 3.0 Trimmer offers a replaceable ceramic blade with advanced skin safe technology, which helps reduce grooming accidents. These formulations are all vegan, cruelty free, dye free, sulfate free, and paraben free, so you know their products are legit for you guys that. That care about that kind of stuff. For a limited time only, for the time to followers, the time to football faithful, you guys, fans of the show, you get 20% off free and free shipping at manscaped.com with the code T, the number two, F. Promo code T2F. Click the link in the description and use that promo code at checkout to get 20% off and free shipping. Whether this be for your partner, your dad, your brother, your friend, get them something that they will actually use and it's almost sure to get a laugh. Moving on to other topics for this week's show. The New York Giants are in prime position to win the NFC East division title. The question is, can they hold on to that division lead or is any other team going to surpass them like the Washington football team that just put off this amazing upset against the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Dallas Cowboys still have a shot. The Philadelphia Eagles, if they were to get a spark with Jalen Hurts, have a shot at winning the NFC East. What are the chances that each team were to win the NFC East? To break it down even further, you have to look at the remaining schedule for each of these four teams. There are four games remaining, if you want to count this week, this Sunday, uh, week 14. Let's first start off with the Philadelphia Eagles. We talked about their schedule earlier when we talked about Jalen Hurts. The New Orleans Saints, the Arizona Cardinals, the Dallas Cowboys, and the Washington Redskins. Just kidding. Just want to make sure you're paying attention. The football team. They currently stand at 3-8-1, the Philadelphia Eagles do. The Saints, if we want to go ahead and just pick favorites to win and favorites to lose, let's go ahead and say that the Saints are going to beat the Eagles. Okay, 3-9-1. The Arizona Cardinals are a little bit on the decline. Let's say they're still... Favorited, they still have a better record. They're still the better team, and you have a rookie quarterback. Let's say that Kyler Murray, his shoulder were to get better, and he were to beat the Eagles. Okay, three, ten, and one. But then the last two games, you got the Cowboys, you got the the football team. You're pretty much even with those two teams. Say you pull off the victory and you win two games. So let's say out of these four games, the Eagles win two out of the next four games. They would stand at five, ten, and one as their final record. Okay, so keep that in mind. 5, 10, and 1. The Dallas Cowboys, they're 3 and 9. Their schedule might be the easiest out of any remaining NFC East team. The Cincinnati Bengals, which, by the way, this game against the Bengals, revenge game for Andy Dalton. He's going to show up, or at least I hope, he's going to play lights out. So I am excited for Andy Dalton and for him to get that revenge against the Cincinnati Bengals. The San Francisco 49ers, the Philadelphia Eagles, and the New York Giants. So the Bengals, Niners, uh, Eagles, and the Giants are the remaining four games. Pretty simple schedule. Not too difficult at that point. So let's say out of those four games, the Cowboys were to win three out of those four games. Three out of four. That puts you at six and ten. All right, so now they surpass the the Eagles, who were five, ten, and one. The Cowboys surpass them. And now they lead the division at six and ten. Cool. The Washington football team, the 49ers, the Seahawks, the Panthers, the Eagles, they currently sit at 5-7. and seven. They don't have the tiebreaker with the New York Giants because of those two losses that they suffered against them earlier this season, but they're at second place right now. 
out of those four games between the Niners, Seahawks, Panthers, and the Eagles, let's say that they win two of them. Okay, they, they're capable of beating the Eagles. They're capable of beating the Panthers if they were to uh, sit Christian McCaffrey and shut him out for the remainder of the 2020 season. They're even capable of being the 49ers at that point. It's possible. But let's say between the 49ers and the Panthers, they were to lose to one of those teams and they were to beat another one of those teams. So that would put them at 7-9. and nine. But then here's the New York Giants who have been playing lights out. That have been surprising a lot of people, starting one and seven, and then winning four games straight, even without their starting quarterback this last week against one of the better teams in the NFL in the in the Seattle Seahawks. They sit at five and seven. What is their remaining schedule? The Arizona Cardinals, the Cleveland Browns, the Baltimore Ravens, the Dallas Cowboys. Pretty tough schedule. Except especially if you want to talk about the Browns and the, the Ravens, let's go ahead and count those as losses. Now they have nine losses on the season. The Cowboys. They're capable of beating them. The wild card this week is so important in beating the Arizona Cardinals because the Giants, the Cardinals, yeah, record-wise, they're kind of neck and neck, but the Cardinals kind of sort of had the edge. But because of the recent struggles with Kyler Murray and the injury to his shoulder that he's been having, the Giants are in prime position to beat the Cardinals. And if they do, they would go to 7-9 and nine if we want to say that the Browns and the Ravens were to beat them. They'd be at 7-9, and nine, so would be the Washington football team, and the Giants have the tiebreaker, and they would win the NFC East and make the postseason at 7-9. and nine. Leave your comments, leave your thoughts. Do you see this as a realistic possibility that the Giants were to make the postseason interact with us? Because I was going back and forth. It might be the Giants, and it might be the, the football team. And then at a certain point, I was like, oh, look at the schedule. Like the Giants could easily, easily go 6-10, and 10, and the football team easily could go 7-9. and nine, So the football team would make it in. But then I thought about Antonio Gibson. And I thought about the injury that he had. And I thought about how that's going to be a big loss for the football team. Because a stout run defense in the 49ers this week. Which, by the way, Antonio Gibson, it's not ruled out that he's not going to play. But more than likely he's not. Because according to reports, this turf toe is very painful. So J.D. McKissick and Peyton Barber are more than likely going to lead the backfield for the football team. This game against the 49ers, a stout run defense. You have no run defense, so a lot of pressure is going to be have to is it going to have to put on Alex Smith in this revenge game, quote unquote, against the San Francisco 49ers. I don't see it happening. I see this lo- uh, this Sunday being a loss for the Washington football team. The 49ers picking up that victory, and if Antonio Gibson were to sit out another week. Well, they're going to lose against the Seattle Seahawks, but if we were to lose or sit out another week after that, the Carolina Panthers, who have a pretty weak run defense, it's going to be pretty pretty tough at that point to really pull off a victory moving forward for the remainder of the season. So I think the loss of Antonio Gibson is going to be big and the key for the Giants in making that NFC East or winning that NFC East division title. The Giants have just been wonderful. They've always had... These great defensive pieces around them on their team. They had Leonard Williams, which the stats may not show up, but he's been playing very, very well. You have James Bradbury, who's more and more every single week becoming more and more of that corner that can line up with the number one receiver and shadow him every single week. Still gives up some big plays here and there. Still isn't perfect. Still has some flaws here and there. But James Bradbury is one of the better cornerbacks who is developing into, I would say, edging right into that top 10 category of one of the best cornerbacks in the National Football League currently. So they have some good, solid players on that defense, and that's been key for them picking up some victories because their offense, their offense we all know about the turnovers. We all know about the, the injuries that they've suffered as well. Uh, Wayne Gallman has stepped up really well for Devontae Freeman and Saquon Barkley. Colt McCoy played really well and did his job and did enough to help pick up the victory against the Seattle Seahawks. And this Giants team... They have the depth to pick up for teams or, or, or pick up for the players that are injured. They had the defense to compete with some pretty good teams. For the Giants to make the NFC East or make the NFL postseason by winning the NFC East, high probability. And I like their chances. And that's why I'm rolling as a Giants as my favorite to win this division title. But if you guys have a different favorite, if you guys agree or disagree, leave your comments and interact with us. Let me know who your favorites are to win this title title. 
One of these NFC East teams, the Washington football team, upset the Pittsburgh Steelers, handing them their first loss of the season this past Monday night. Which, by the way, I don't know if you guys had any trouble trying to find this game anywhere. I could not find it. I could not find it. What I do is usually I watch Sling. Uh, I have a subscription to Sling to watch NFL Red Zone uh, on Sundays. And then Thursday night games, Monday night games, or any other games, individual games that I want to watch, I watch on YouTube TV. Could not find it on YouTube TV. And I was like, oh, okay, well, let me sign up for a free trial on, on Hulu because Hulu has live sports from the commercials that we see. Was not on Hulu. And I was like, dude, where the heck is this? So I just commented on an Instagram post and uh, some guy was like, yeah, bro, go to this shady website, crackstreams.com. And I found it. I really found it. So uh, congratulate or thank you for uh, for helping me find that, uh, find that stream. But um, congratulations to my computer because now it has a virus. Just kidding. No, it doesn't. But uh, yeah, so they pull off that upset victory against the Pittsburgh Steelers who have not been looking great the last couple weeks. Are the Steelers on a decline going into the NFL postseason? This past week against Washington, we have to give Washington some credit. Okay, their, their defense really played well. But we want to talk about that game against the Baltimore Ravens as well the week prior. I know it was Wednesday. I know it got pushed back as a COVID. It might have just messed things up. But they didn't look that, that well at all. They, they had the game in their hands, it seemed like. And then they just gave up a, a big touchdown to uh, the GOATs, Trace McSorley. I don't want to say Trace McSorley, McSorley is the, uh, the greatest quarterback of all time. But he's probably... I would say like 15th or 20th like greatest quarterback of all time. So like I, I understand why they would give up that touchdown to him because he's pretty freaking good, but they almost lost that game against the Baltimore Ravens. So the question is, can they just rebound and just prevent the skid that, they're, that they've been on recently? We have to look at the remaining schedule. The four games remaining for the Pittsburgh Steelers are the Buffalo Bills this week, uh, Sunday Night Football. That's going to be a great game. The Cincinnati Bengals, the Indianapolis Colts, and the Cleveland Browns. Three of these teams have a winning record, and they're very, very good. The Bills, the Colts, and the Browns. Let's say out of those three games, because we, we expect, we know anything could happen, but we expect the Bengals to, to lose to the Steelers. So they got one victory. They now have 12 games won for the season. Out of the Bills, the Colts, and the Browns, which of these teams can they beat? Well, if they play the way that they've been playing, Recently, the last couple of games, they're going to lose to all of these teams. And there's a high possibility that they could go 12-4. and four. However, if they turn things around and if they were to uh, just say, okay, those games were outliers, we're still a very good team, they can beat the Colts. They could beat the Browns. Maybe you lose to the Bills. So let's just say out of those three games, they beat two of them. Okay, They, they beat two of those three teams. Then you sit at 13-3. and three. Which sounds great, sounds amazing, but the question is, will they get that first round by? Because there's seven teams now in each conference for the postseason run. Meaning that the Kansas City Chiefs, led by MVP favorite Patrick Mahomes, will be candidates to get that first round by. And Pittsburgh will be left out as the second seed. Facing the seventh seed, what are some teams that have the possibility of being the seventh team? In the NFL, well, there's, or in the AFC, there's the Tennessee Titans, who are very good and could upset any good team at any given point with the offense that they have. There's the Baltimore Ravens, which we see with Lamar Jackson. If you lost almost without Lamar Jackson, when you get Lamar Jackson back, it's a possibility that they could pick up a victory against the Pittsburgh Steelers because it's very hard for any team to pick up three straight victories or three games, three victories won against a division rival playing in the postseason as well. But this is history. This isn't the first time that we've seen this where a team has started out hot and it kind of fizzle out. Other examples of that include the 2008 New York Giants. Started 11-1, had one loss against the Cleveland Browns. I believe it was week five, week six. 11-1, fresh off the Super Bowl. Eli Manning, great, Pro Bowl year. They finished 1-3, and three, and they lost their first game that they played in the postseason. They had a first-round bye, but they lost against the Philadelphia Eagles, who weren't that good. They were 9-6-1, I believe was a record, and they lost to them in the divisional round. Okay, that's just one example. The following year, 2009 Colts. 
They elected to sit their starters the last two games. Jim, Jim Caldwell did. They could have gone undefeated. They were 14-0. They sat out their, their starters the last two games. That ended up costing them. They lost the Super Bowl that season. The 2011 Green Bay Packers. All right, They lost to the Kansas City Chiefs. Upset victory with Kyle Orton as the quarterback. And what was, I think the score was 7-3 to or something ridiculous like that, like a defensive game. And then they lost their first game that they played in the playoffs that year to the New York Giants, who eventually went on to win the Super Bowl. Most recently, the 2019 Baltimore Ravens. All right, they started off 2-2, two and two, had that loss against the Kansas City Chiefs in Week 3. Uh, and then they ended up going 14-2. and two. They lost to the Titans in the divisional round, their first game that they played in the playoffs that season. Are you picking up on a little trend where teams that start off hot end up fizzling out the last four games, three games, whatever it may be, and they end up losing a game in their first their first game in the postseason that year? Now, the Colts, they went on to the Super Bowl, so maybe they're not a perfect example of that, but... Uh, this is history. We've seen this time and time again. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's easy for teams to, to realize like, oh, it, you know, for teams to pick up on how they're doing and pick up on their on their game plan. And uh, maybe just some players aren't that motivated when the season, you know, keeps on chugging along. But I don't know what it may be. But the Pittsburgh Steelers are right now on the cusp of being one of those teams. One of those teams that could lose their first game in the postseason, maybe their second game, not get past the divisional round. So what are your thoughts? Do you guys believe that the Pittsburgh Steelers are in danger of, of this happening, of another skid happening and just being another, you know, just another transaction, another uh, a blip, another uh, outlier of these teams losing and getting on the skid? Because what I believe is for the Pittsburgh Steelers to avoid this skid, you've got to get the run game going. You really do. And maybe it's going to be this week with James Conner now activated against the Buffalo Bills, who haven't been that good at stopping the run. Maybe it could be this week that the run game starts going. But that's the one area that you've been lacking. And I believe if the Pittsburgh Steelers were to just get that together and were to get the run game going, this offense would be better than ever. We know the passing game just it does really well, but you can't just rely on that all the time. The Steelers could have tied this game. Actually, they could have won this game by a point if they were elected or if they just ran into the end zone with Benny Snell four different times. They tried. They really did. But they didn't get in. They are on the goal line. And they could have won this game 24-23. But this run game, it needs to pick up the slack. It really does to avoid another skid for the Pittsburgh Steelers. But leave your thoughts down below. What do you guys believe is going to happen for the Pittsburgh Steelers and their fate this upcoming postseason. The last segment of the show, fantasy football question. The favorite part for you guys. The fantasy football playoffs are among us. And what I like to do every single week is I like to bob and weave, get past those Asian bots that are in the comments, and choose a few comments that I get to answer live on this show as we premiere it. So, first question is from Martin Pena. Pena? Pena? I don't know if the little squiggly is above the N or not, but Pena. What do you think about Goddard this week? Dallas Goddard is now the tight end, the favorite tight end in the Philadelphia Eagles uh, offense over Zach Ertz, who just came back from an injury. And maybe he was just getting phased into the offense this past week against the Green Bay Packers. But Goddard has been the better of the two uh, between, or better of the two tight ends. So Goddard, I'm going to go ahead and just say, keep on starting him. Keep starting him because he's not only the best of the two right now, currently between him and Zach Ertz, but he's the best receiver. And for Jalen Hurts, who's going to be under pressure, who's going to have to dump off the ball, short yardage, passing routes, go with Dallas Goddard, dump offs. If you, Especially if you're in PPR leagues, I would go ahead and start Dallas Goddard this week against the Saints, who have been not so good against tight ends this season. Next one, CT22 Coasters. What are your thoughts on the CMC injury? I explained this a little bit earlier in the podcast. I believe they're going to shut him out. I really do. I, I think it's going to be the Mike Davis show from here on out. I don't think that Christian McCaffrey has any reason or any motivation 
Uh, well, maybe he does, but the Panthers don't have any motivation to play Christian McCaffrey. And the three injuries that he suffered, I don't think they want to take any more chances and just want to be healthy going into 2021. So I, I think he's going to get shut out. I really do. And I don't, I don't like his chances of playing this week. I don't like him playing next week for the remainder of the season. I'm sorry if you're a Christian McCaffrey owner. I really am. I know injuries suck. Listen, I had Saquon Barkley. I had DeAndre Swift. I had OBJ. I had Debo Samuel. I had Connor go on COVID. I had Dallas Goddard get injured. There's just so many injuries and so many things happening this fantasy football season that it, it sucks, but I'm sorry, man. I, I, I don't see that Christian McCaffrey is... I don't like his chances of playing the, for the remainder of the season. The next one is from James Ballot Bat. Is it a good idea to start both A.J. Brown and Corey Davis against Jacksonville? Yes, it's okay because these two receivers are neck and neck. And I've been a high on Corey Davis all season long. And those ads and drops of videos, he's been my ad of the week three different times. Funny story about Corey Davis. I picked him up uh, after he had an explosive week one game against the Denver Broncos. I was like, wow, this guy looks amazing. He's finally going to be that first round talent that this Tennessee Titans team wanted him or drafted him to be. I'm going to pick him up. He's going to be a sleeper wide receiver if I need some depth or if, you know, if someone has a bye week, I need to push him in or plug him in. It's going to be Corey Davis for me. And then I had to drop him because I had so many receivers. He got COVID. It was on that COVID list. Corey Davis was. And I had so many injuries and I had to drop him. And I was like, all right, well, hold. I need a running back so bad. So I picked up a running back. I had to drop Co- uh, Corey Davis. And then I tried getting him again. And then someone beat me to it when he got off the COVID list. And then I was like, dude, what can I give up? What can I give up for Corey Davis? Because I really like this guy. And eventually, I just traded Devin Singletary. To my surprise, he was a big Devin Singletary fan. So I was like, oh, yeah, sure. Have Devin Singletary. Give me Corey Davis. So I got Corey Davis, and he's been doing really well for me uh, as of late. So he's neck and neck with A.J. Brown in terms of fantasy points on who's going to be the leading receiver in terms of fantasy points for the Tennessee Titans. It's okay, and it's a good situation if the matchup is great to start A.J. Brown and Corey Davis. A.J. Brown, I would start as a wide receiver one every single week, regardless of the matchup. He's that freaking good. Corey Davis is going to be a good, reliable flex play every single week moving forward. That's how I'm going to be treating him, so you have good chances or good odds of doing well with both receivers if you were to start him. Kevin Acklin. Chiefs, Ravens, 49ers, or Titans defense this week? IDKY, but I'm leaning Chiefs. The Chiefs are a must-sit for me this week. Just because the Chiefs defense does good when the matchup is good, does bad when the matchup is bad. And this week is a bad matchup. I know that Tua Tagovailoa isn't as talented or doing it as well as Ryan Fitzpatrick this season, but... I still want to trust the Chiefs defense against that offense that just got back. Miles Gaskin, who's been looking great. Looks great in his first game back against the Cincinnati Bengals. Tugavailoa seems to be playing well. Has been developing a connection finally with his tight end, Mike Kosicki. We all know about Devontae Parker and his talent. So I wouldn't start the Kansas City Chiefs defense. The Ravens against the Browns, I would choose them against the Chiefs or over the Chiefs. Because we all know that this Ravens defense is much more talented than the Chiefs. We all know that this Browns offense has the case of, a capability of messing up at any point. They've been productive and they've been looking good. And now all that is credited to Kevin Stefanski and his, his play calling. But the Ravens can expose the Browns like they did in week one, only limiting them to six points. The 49ers or the Titans, the Titans against the Jags, I, I don't care how bad the Jags the Jaguars often says, if you saw that game against Minnesota, you know that if a bad defense goes up against a bad offense uh, with the, the offense being Jacksonville, Jacksonville is going to expose that and they're going to uh, put up some points, especially if they have James Robinson. But the 49ers against Washington, I would start that as well. So the Ravens or the 49ers would be the ones that I would lean towards. Don't go with the Chiefs. I promise you it's not going to work out. PG too great. I have Michael Thomas, Woods, AJ Brown, and Godwin. Can someone give me three to start? I don't think, is Chris Godwin going to play this week? I know that he's injured. I know that he wasn't practicing last week. So I don't know if he's going to be playing this week. That's why I put Antonio Brown as one of my must starts for this week, just to make up for the loss of Chris Godwin. So it's going to come down to a game time decision at that point. 
So what you really have to look at is, are you going to start Robert Woods here tonight? I don't know if you're going to have time to see this, but are you going to start Robert Woods tonight over someone that might be a game time decision this Sunday? It depends on who the player is. That could be a game time decision. Depends on the matchup, but I wouldn't take the risk. And I would go ahead and start Robert Woods because even though the matchup, you may look at it and be like, oh, well, the Patriots defense has been playing well as of late. You've got Stephon Gilmore. You've got JC Jackson, who have been good cornerbacks. Listen, the way that the Rams offense operates for the past two years with their receivers, they had these good games and matchups that may not seem that good because there are a lot of dump off passes. So if you're in PPR leagues and if you have Robert Woods, 100%, I would start him every single week just because you got to look at it. You got to look at these dump off passes. These routes that they run are designed to just get the ball out quick and let them get some yards after the catch, and let Cooper Cup and Robert Woods make the play. Because when you look at the reception leaders every single week who have double-digit receptions, you may look at like, okay, Michael Thomas got double-digit receptions for the week. Yeah, that makes sense. DeAndre Hopkins, yeah, that makes sense. Keenan Allen, yeah, that makes sense. Justin Herbert's favorite target. Robert Woods? Does he belong in that category? And the answer is yes. He may have those games that he gets 12 receptions for a ridiculous 131 yards or something like that. And this could be one of those games. So, Regardless of the matchup, Robert Woods seems to get uh, seems to be a PPR machine just because of those dump off passes. So I would start Michael Thomas, Robert Woods, and AJ Brown. Mister McElmo's drunk. I see you commenting. You've been commenting for the last three years. Thank you for your support. Logan Thomas or John Smith? If Johnu plays, I'm going to go ahead and go with Johnu Smith. I had Anthony Ferkser as a sleeper of the week tight end. Seven targets last week. And a third, more than a third of Ryan Tannehill's touchdowns go to tight ends. The Jacksonville Jaguars have given up nine touchdowns this season to the tight end position. So I would start John Smith. I don't like his chances of playing this week because he didn't practice all week. So more than likely this week he's going to be limited in some sort of fashion. So it's going to be a game time decision. But if it comes down to a game time decision and he's not going to be limited, he's good to go. John Smith over Logan Thomas all the way. We still have to wait and see if Logan Thomas can be non-touchdown dependent to put up great fantasy numbers. Last week was the first time that he had a game with over four receptions. So I, I don't trust Logan Thomas right now, especially if the matchup isn't that good, which the 49ers are first in the NFL uh, in fantasy football, at least against the tight end position. The last question from Mark Pedri, Pedri, Herbert or Tannehill? I've been, I think I chose this one because I've seen three or four different people with the same exact question. Herbert or Tannehill? My answer is Tannehill. I like Herbert. Hasn't been looking good the last couple weeks, so that should give you a little bit of concern. I know it's the Atlanta Falcons defense, and this has the capability of being a high-scoring game. So Herbert and Matt Ryan may go back and forth, uh, touchdown after touchdown, but Herbert hasn't been looking good. We know that the, the Falcons defense under Raheem Morris has really stepped it up, and they have the capability of shutting down quarterbacks if needed. We all know about the game against Las Vegas and Derek Carr. Ryan Tannehill, on the other hand, is a good player, can get it done with his, with his legs as well in the passing game, and Jacksonville is just not that good on defense compared to the Atlanta Falcons. So uh, if you want to put Herbert and Tannehill on a level field of as far as how productive they've been in fantasy football and how good of a quarterback and their talent is, you have to look at the matchup. And then at that point, I would favor Tannehill more than Herbert at that point. Well, that's it. That's it for this week's episode of Time to Football. Thank you guys for submitting your questions. And thank you guys for uh, staying with us for this whole entire uh, podcast. If you guys are listening to us on iTunes, be sure to go over to YouTube, youtube.com slash time to football. Subscribe to us on there so you can uh, watch much more content that we come out with uh, throughout the week. And vice versa, if you want to uh, listen to us on the go, go to the iTunes app on the podcast app, uh, search for Time to Football, listen to us on the go so you don't have to watch a whole 35, 45 minute video up on YouTube. But for you guys that have been joining us for the chat, thank you guys so much for joining us and, and, and asking your questions. And if you have any sort of questions throughout the week, be sure to comment on these videos, these starts and sits videos. Now I'll try my absolute best to respond to you guys and help you guys out before your fantasy football playoff matchup. Dude, congratulations. Con congratulations. I am I am so happy for you. You're going to do good. You're, you're amazing. You're wonderful. Make it the fantasy football playoffs, whoever you are, whatever your situation is. I'm so proud of you. Congratulations. You're going to win this week, and you're going to win that fantasy football title. I'm manifesting it. 
I'm manifesting it that every person that listens to Time to Football is going to win their fantasy football championship that is eligible. If you missed the postseason, my condolences. But thank you guys so much for watching this episode. It is week 14 of the National Football League 2020 NFL season, and Adam Gase is still the head coach of the New York Jets. Enjoy the game, and I'll see you next week.